Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Our guest tonight, I'm really excited about his presence with us because he brings to this story of how God has changed his life. He brings to the story a lot of perspectives. And uh, Father John Markham is our guest. He's former Southern Baptist, former Presbyterian, uh, former doctor. I don't know, you probably shouldn't use former on that, but this, this is all the what he brings to the story as well as his own journey of faith as a husband and a father. All of that has come together and shaping his journey and particularly the gifts that he brings with him as a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ coming to serve in the church. And so, Father Markham, it's great to welcome you. you to the journey home. Uh, we, we have a lot of stuff in our backgrounds that are similar, so it's neat to it's talk to you about that, but it's great to have you on the program. Thank you. Uh, what I, you've seen the program, so you know what I need to do first, and that's get out of the way. I invite you to go way back and give us a little glimpse of your spiritual upbringing. I was blessed to always have the gift of the Christian faith. I was born and raised in North Carolina, and this was a fundamentalist Southern Baptist home. My mother originally had been Methodist, and when she married my father, who was a staunch Southern Baptist, she became Southern Baptist, and that's how I was raised. It's usually the direction it goes in the and, Bible Belt, right, to the yes, Southern Baptist, that's right. Yes, and like I say, I always had the gift of the Christian faith. And it was natural to have Bible readings, religious singing in the home, even as a child. Hmm. As a child, though, I suffered uh, ill health over a protracted period of time. And I was spending a lot of time in doctor's offices, hospitals, and clinics. And that's where there had been no physician in my family. Hmm. But that was where I got fascinated with medicine. And by the age of five, I had made up my mind that what I wanted to do in life was to be a medical doctor. It's interesting that at that time, my father was serving in World War II. So I was, at that period of my life, I was raised in a world of women because all the oh, men sure. were in the theater, either in the Pacific or in Europe. I remember at age five, my paternal grandmother, out of, for whatever reason, out of 13 grandchildren, she singled me out and told me that I was going to be the first preacher in the family. And I contested that and I told her, no, I'm going to be the first doctor in the family. Now it turns out we're both right. <laughs> now, it, it's, the image you would have had at that period would have been doctors visiting in the homes. Is that right? Is Actually, that it would have been that plus going to offices and, and clinics. Okay, sure. And it was just si the smells, the instruments. It, it just fascinated me. <laughs> and plus, I knew that as bad as I felt after that visit or visits, I felt better. <laughs> and I, I want to be able to do this. So, but, but what, often when you're brought up in an, uh, a, a religious soup where everybody around you has a strong faith, uh, it's easy to get absorbed in that without your own acceptance of that. Was that true of you or did you have an authentic conversion as a young man? No conversion. There was never any doubt. It was just smooth sailing the whole way. All right. And you need to also know, and the viewers need to know, that my paternal grandfather, for whom I'm named, and my father, um, there was John Calvin Markham Sr., John Calvin Markham Jr., I'm the third, my son is the fourth. It has nothing to do with the John Calvin. John Calvin was an officer in the Confederate Army, and that's who my grandfather was named for. So the religious upbringing, the atmosphere in my grandparents' home, this extended to the extended family of Markhams, and this was in Durham and Raleigh, North Carolina. I grew up in Burlington, which at the time was a sleepy textile town in the late 40s and early 50s, no longer. There was no Catholic presence in my life 
at until I became an undergraduate uh, in, in college. And that's the first time I'd actually had any real contact with, with a Catholic. I knew nothing about Catholicism except as I matured, I guess, hearing negative things about sure. it, being in the Bible Belt. Right. But um, I never, there was not mm -hmm. a Catholic presence in Burlington at the time that I was aware of. So it was no, there was no exposure to Catholicism. I never doubted my Baptist faith. I was baptized um, at age 10, member of the First Baptist Church in Burlington, which we attended faithfully every Sunday. And I had an interest in music and there was a very active ministry in the boys' choir in that church. And I joined it at the, I can't remember if I was six or seven, and stayed in it for as long as you could. It's interesting that that minister of music had us sing everything in Latin. Oh, interesting. And we sang what, I didn't know they were Catholic hymns at the time, <laughs> Sanctus and so forth. We actually toured a region of the southeast, North Carolina and Virginia. And I can remember my parents going as chaperones on some of those tours. So I developed a love of traditional sure. sacred music very early in, in life, and that continues to this day. Did, did your group sing those in Baptist worship? Yes. Okay. And especially on, in tours. And these would be in churches of different denominations, but never a Catholic church. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, that says that you have a, you had a well-trained music director who appreciated the bigger picture of yes. music and not just the, the little sliver of a certain tradition. Yes. So you went on then, uh, full steam ahead into towards medical school through oh, high yes. school and college. And one thing about my personality uh, was I, I was a driven person, the classic overachiever, the control freak, mm -hmm. and I had tunnel vision, and it was going to be medicine, medicine, medicine. I was active in a lot of extracurricular activities, but it was always medicine. And I was privileged to win a prestigious academic scholarship to Duke University, and that was the pre-med track. At that period, Duke required you to have two scripture courses in order to graduate, and you had to pass them. You had to have a course in Old Testament and a course in New Testament. When I took that required course in Old Testament, my professor had several PhDs. He also happened to be an ordained Baptist minister and did his work at Baylor. And he was, uh, he actually had a, served in a church there in Durham and a full professor. And here I am in a Methodist university. I became enamored with the world that he opened to me. I was a fundamentalist, and he was a biblical scholar in the truest sense of the word. And he opened up a whole new world. Opened your horizons yes. out of a real strict yes. fundamentalism. Yes, and so when I took, I took the New Testament course under him as well, and I was so energized by that, it was changing my life as far as my perspective on my faith. And it's interesting that both my father and grandfather went as high in the, quote, lack of a better term, hierarchy of the Baptist denomination in their particular local churches, other than being an ordained minister. At some point, my father was introduced to a publication called the Presbyterian Outlook, of which I'm yes. sure you're familiar with right. that. Exactly. And so he subscribed to it, and he used that to prepare his Sunday school lessons every Sunday. He did that for a number of years. I remember that when I was taking these courses at Duke, started looking at some of it. When I'd go visit, I would look at some of his uh, material, and I was even more fascinated. To go into fast forward, I went to the dean at that time who was responsible for guiding those of us who were going into medicine to make sure that we get, were able to apply to the schools that we wanted to attend. And I asked permission to take a double track to be able to do religious studies and pre-med studies. And he told me, and I'll never forget it, he said, John, 
if you ever intend to do anything like this with liberal arts, particularly religious studies, you need to do it now because once you enter medical school, it's going to be nothing but science, science, science. Mm -hmm. So I did that. My, actually, my undergraduate degree is in religious studies. And then I went to medical school at the University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. So the seeds were being planted as far as my doing something other than medicine. They were being planted very early. I just didn't know it. Was your religious experience there at Duke a good one? I mean, some of the schools were leaning in a progressive direction. Actually, I was so absorbed in my studies. It was, it was more not issues of discussion. It was issue of, of discovery for me with biblical scholarship because I was, had that familiarity with the scriptures as a Baptist and having done that literally all my life. But I never questioned anything and I never put things into context. And by using the biblical scholarship, it just really energized me. So much so that I left the Baptist church and became a Presbyterian. The reason I became a Presbyterian at that time was we had a very dynamic on the, Duke has two campuses, East Campus and West Campus. Historically, the West Campus has been for men, East for women, and there's intermingling. That no, that's different now. But there was a Presbyterian church right across the street from East Campus, and I remember the pastor's name, Dr. Bennett. He was a real scholar. And he was very, very popular with the students. And someone invited me to go listen to one of his sermons. I was blown away. And so I started going to that Presbyterian church and eventually became Presbyterian. A lot of the audience is not going to be familiar with the distinct differences between Baptist and Presbyterian. If you look back, what would you say would be the major change in your life at that point from Baptist to Presbyterian? The pres what attracted me to the Presbyterian tradition at that period of my life, and remember I, here I am in an academic institution, mm -hmm. was their emphasis on academics and education. Okay. Going back to the Hebrew, to Greek, but don't get me wrong, I don't, ha I don't <laughs> study Hebrew or Greek and wouldn't even attempt to go there, but it was just the methodology the meticulous, uh, the scholarship, that's what really appealed to me, still does. Yeah. But that was the thing that I realized that I, I just don't fit anymore with this tradition. And it was interesting that in sharing this with my father, he was struggling with some of the issues that I had struggled with mm -hmm. that were polarizing then the Southern Baptist Convention. And he had, years before, had been attracted to the Presbyterian methodology and their scholarship. And so once I made that move, they followed me into the Presbyterian church where they were living at the time. Well, Presbyterians are always more uh, open to creedal expressions, the history of creeds. Yes. History itself, uh, it, whereas often Baptists are not quite as open to that. And the other thing that in, in looking back, this is so many years ago now. I can actually remember the uh, Baptist minister at the time who baptized me and a discussion that he and my father had about, my father raised the question of sacraments. And he was told at the time, and you gotta remember this is just one individual opinion about that, well, as Baptists, there are no sacraments as such. Mm -hmm. And so my father didn't say anything else. Um, so then uh, seemed like there was some other issue that, that came up, but that was one that really he pondered for a long time and we discussed and he said, do you ever talk about this at college? <laughs> I said, well actually no, because I'm just, I was just focused on the, um, the scriptural looking at the history of the authorship, which again, in the, the whole principles of biblical scholarship which as Catholics we would take for granted. Right. Right. It was new to me as a, as a Southern Baptist. It was just new to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it fascinated me and so that's, that was For the most fundamentalist of them, it's the Bible alone, that's it. 
Well, yeah, that was yeah. the way, that's the way it was with me. That's right. Okay. So you headed off to medical school as a Presbyterian then? Yes. Did, you, did your faith, your new Presbyterian faith, have an effect on your studies in medicine? And your Actually, no. I would say that it, there was not a, as I recall, my faith did not change. My, certainly my value system did not change because that had been inculcated from the time of, as a child. And for that, I'm grateful to my parents and grandparents. So that didn't change. What did change was just the, the type of reading. Well, once I got into medical school, the, my dean had meant was right. And there, there wasn't, there wasn't uh, this got put on the shelf. This was on the back burner. And then I was going just full bore into medicine, medicine, medicine. So I'm wondering whether your values that you'd had from a child, were they challenged at all with the things you were learning or being called to do as a doctor? Not at that, no. Okay. But I did have an experience as a third year medical student, and this was a pediatric case that shook me to the core. Hmm. And I remember walking in the dark from the hospital to my apartment just to try to get myself together because I thought that I had participated in something that basically um, I could have, that could have been fatal or resulted in irreversible, dam irreversible damage. And it turned out after that particular incident, uh, which I was another and a classmate and I were involved in this, it, it was, um, we were just trying to get a sample of blood in a very small infant. And things did not go well. And it shook us up. Everything turned out okay, but it, I was so shaken by that experience that, and it turned out, then they changed the hospital policy about you had to have more training in order to attempt to do something like we were asked to do. So that shook me. And I, that was really the first time that the door opened that I thought, could it be that God wants me to do something with my life other than medicine or in addition to medicine? That was the first conscious awareness that I had. Well, what, did you move on to this other area at, at this point? Because uh, I know you're involved with ethics. Was that your next step, or what? Well, no. The I was married at the time. Okay. And unfortunately, my wife uh, developed several health problems, uh, which became obvious after the uh, the first, excuse me, the second pregnancy. And at that time, I already was um, had my MD, and um, I had was at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta for internal medicine internship and, and residency when the, the children were born. And things in the marriage were not going well. It was um, in large part, if not completely, due to the health issues, some of which were mental health. And it was very, very rough. And it was during those years that I started to question myself about maybe I went back to the experience as a third year medical student. Maybe God was trying to get my attention, but I wasn't going to go there. Mm -hmm. And I did not move from that particular mindset until the ultimate tragedy happened after 19 years of marriage and two children that uh, my wife committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And at that time, our son was 11, our daughter was 13. And this had been building for years. Mm -hmm. And it's in spite of the best attempts, interventions, finest medical care, et cetera, it was not prevented. As you can imagine, that shook me and, of course, the children to the core. And that really got my attention. I thought, okay, maybe there, there really is something here that I need, I need to be looking at, that God is wanting me to do something else with my life or in addition to medicine. And it was at that time, being the control freak, 
that I just said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna make a deal with you, Lord. If you can just help me get these children raised to responsible adulthood and get them educated, and I'll continue to practice medicine, and then when they're gone, we can, we'll talk. <laughs> That's the ultimate control freak. So that was the mindset at the time. And as you can imagine, the, well, I had, have had years of counseling, so, and the children as well. And this was even before the suicide because of what we had to try to cope with going through, sure. at home. And after this, counseling certainly intensified because when you're dealing with uh, a case of suicide survivors, that can be very, well, painful is not the word, but it was right after what I shared with you, that mindset, that I was struggling and thinking that, um, all right, I'm gonna raise these children as a single parent. And it was at that point, literally within weeks, that an angel came into our lives, someone that I had known professionally, a woman who uh, had never been married, her name was Cindy, and she came into our lives and it was because of our collegial relationship it, it occurred to me after a number of weeks that with all I was involved in with the children, with my practice and other responsibilities, it would be nice just to go out to dinner and have adult conversation with a very intelligent woman. And so we did. And then over time, our discussions got deeper. And I remember before there was ever anything romantic that I shared with her my struggle that had been going on for years, that I really was afraid and finally had to admit that God was trying to get my attention, that he wanted me to do something with my life, either instead of medicine or in addition to medicine. And I remember looking at her across the table like I'm looking at you now, and I said, the thing that scares me the most is that it could be something as drastic as being a Catholic priest. And I'm not even Catholic. The reason I could say that is- Where that come from? Yeah. It came from years of working in a Catholic hospital hmm. as a physician. And this was uh, the former St. Joseph Hospital in Augusta, sponsored by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet out of Missouri. In the years that I practiced there, I was moved by the witness of the service witness of the priest chaplains and the sisters who staffed that hospital. No one ever approached me and asked, Dr. Markham, have you ever considered becoming a Catholic? That question was never raised, never. And I just observed day in and day out their witness, their silent witness, their service witness and over time, it became obvious to me that they had something I didn't have. And when I realized that what they had that I didn't have was the Catholic faith, that got my attention. Now, this, was that, uh, well, first of all, did your wife, your second wife, right, eventually? Both uh, my wives were Presbyterian. I was wondering was, what kind of faith she brought with her when she came. Devout Presbyterians. All right. So, so she didn't bring with you the Catholic no, uh, spark? No, no, not at all. But and when, you, was, when you uttered that comment to her, what, I mean, you were well, really she knew, thinking I mean, that at all, I mean, about being a Catholic priest, that was just no, the no, most it was, No, that was just something, obviously it yeah. came from somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, well, now I know where, but um, <laughs> I, was, I was able to share that with her at that depth of uh, sharing, at that depth of sharing. And it was, uh, no, we'd never, there was no discussion of Catholicism uh, at, at that time, not at all. Unfortunately, in, in my experience that with that first marriage being so difficult and traumatic, we married, Cindy and I got married, and after really a whirlwind courtship of just a matter of months, and within a few months, 
of that marriage, she made the uh, announcement that she wanted to adopt the children. Well, that was, well, that's, you know, that, that was not my idea. Uh, it was something that uh, she wanted to do and ultimately she did. And it turned out over the years that we had together, she basically became an angel who saved three lives, mine and the children. Hmm. And what the, the 12 years that we were able to be together are the sentinel years of my, my life. I treasure beyond measure. And it was going from that circumstance in the first marriage being so difficult and then having a marriage the way it should be, mm. truly ideal and idyllic, mm. the perfect model of Christian marriage. Well, 18 months after our wedding, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. And so she started a cycle that went for 10 years of um, relapses, remissions, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, so forth. And what she taught me and the children and everybody else who cared for her, how she went through that with such grace and dignity. And as beautiful as she was exteriorly, her genuine beauty was interior. And she was a powerful witness, not only to me, but to uh, everyone particularly her caregivers. And all of her care was there at St. Joseph Hospital in Augusta. And it was in that experience that she was, on, was seeing what I had seen as a physician in that hospital. We started talking about Catholicism, even though we were very faithful in, in our Presbyterian practice, and, but we were leaning toward Catholicism. But when we would, Every time we would think, okay, now we can start looking at this further, there would be a relapse. That's not a time in your life to be exploring a change in faith tradition. So that was put on the, the uh, back burner. And it was during this period that I need to mention not only the uh, sisters of St. Joseph of Grandelette, but one of the priest chaplains uh, who ultimately became a powerful influence on me and my, my, became my spiritual director and uh, the late Father Daniel Munn. And he and I first met at the Medical College of Georgia. He started the uh, Department of Ethics there back in the late 60s. And we met there. He was an Episcopal minister in addition to being on the MCG faculty. He invited me and my family to uh, worship uh, with them. And he came to the Presbyterian Church with me. He introduced me to the field of medical ethics back in the early 70s. And that started a, another uh, passion in my life, the field of um, healthcare ethics, now bioethics. Right. And Let me pause there. We'll come back in a second because I'd like you to talk more about your passion for that particular area, which has just exploded, right, in the last yes. 30, 40 years. Back to small. Welcome back to the journey home. Our guest tonight is uh, Father Markham, and you're right at that at that space in your uh, your journey where you're talking about uh, ethics and the time that you started that. Talk more about it because that time, uh, early 70s, yes. uh, was a, was a crazy time in the ethics field. 
Well, actually, at that period in health care, here you've got in the early to mid-70s, there was actually a debate, if you can believe it or not, did hospitals even need ethics committees? Mm -hmm. And St. Joseph Hospital was one of the first in the area to, uh, under the direction of Father Munn, to establish an ethics committee. And this being a Catholic institution, what he insisted upon, anybody who was going to serve on that committee had to agree to a formal educational period over on many months. And the syllabus, which I still have, is called Medicine and Christian Morals. And um, it was uh, at that time, this is before, long before internet, this was an extension learning uh, institution out of Virginia. I can't even remember the name of it now. But we went through that syllabus. Now, this was Catholic. I was not Catholic. And there were terms in there like, what do you mean? What is, what is a magisterium? <laughs> so, but I went through the syllabus and I was incredibly impressed. And uh, well, to a certain so, extent, there wasn't anything like that in the other traditions. No, no. Well, and basically that was my introduction to healthcare ethics was the Catholic tradition. Right. And then initially being an ethicist, functioning as an ethicist in a hospital setting, that's what we did and the issues that we dealt with got more and more complicated over the decades. The other thing that I was doing um, in my hospital work was um, looking at, at managed health care and health care administration, hospital governance, medical staff leadership. And in those capacities, I traveled. I was involved in 1984. The Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet formed a system, a health care system. One of our institution was one of their hospitals. This is on a national level. So twice a year, I would travel for these meetings of the system. And those meetings would always occur in May, be the Kentucky Derby weekend, first weekend in May, <laughs> and in October, Columbus Day weekend. Part of the meeting was mass. Well, that was my first exposure to being actually sitting in the back row, not participating, just watching a Catholic mass. So that was twice a year. And I would mention it to Cindy when I would come back and just mention it. I said, yeah, that was. And she said, well, so what's it like? I said, well, we could go sometime. I asked Father Munn. But um, so we did start, occasionally would go sit in the back and just watch and develop certainly an appreciation for the, the liturgy. So that was that exposure. So over time, over these years, that's, that started in um, 1984. So all these, these travels over time and being exposed to the, this large a group of Catholics, the majority of whom were Catholics, not just sisters, but lay people, mm -hmm. physicians, nurses, and being together with them over a period of X number of days in different uh, areas of the country and having conversations with them about things that really matter and hearing the Catholic perspective, it just, it's, it started to grow and grow and grow. And I would discuss this uh, with Cindy and about how I really wanted to do something more in ethics mm -hmm. and that my dream would someday to be an ethicist and maybe after I hang it up the shingle of medicine that I'd be an ethicist and I was thinking well, maybe that's what God really wants me to do <laughs> and so I got more and more involved in, in uh, ethics. Your, what were the years you served as a doctor? When, do, when did you start? Well, I practiced for 31 years. 26 of those were in Augusta as okay. a gastroenterologist. So that was 1973 to 1999. Okay, so and all of those years were St. Joseph Hospital was primarily what so I was doing. So you started right at the Roe versus Wade Yes, I did. Area. Yes, I did. So you saw its impact yes. spread through the system, right? Were you struggling with those issues then long before you thought about the Catholic faith, I imagine? It would have been some quite a few years later before that would come to be a real focal point. And I'll share that 
after I mentioned earlier that bef before uh, Cindy's death, yeah. we had discussed about going into uh, exploring Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Toward the latter part of her life, she died in October of 1995. There would be times she would be uncomfortable and and I would leave the bedroom because I was having difficulty sleeping. I went in one evening and was channel surfing. And there on a channel that I didn't know what I was watching was a man with a coffee mug. He was dressed in white and there was something that said Revelation under it. At that time my daughter was teaching a scripture class up in North, in, uh, North Carolina on, on Revelation. And so I turned the volume up. Well, that was Al McBride. And I thought, who is this? And what is this? I went up, I went to the kitchen and pulled the newspaper out of the trash can. And I had to look to see what number, what is this channel? It was EWTN. I never heard of EWTN. <laughs> well, I started watching it regularly, especially alone and at night when I couldn't sleep. And over time, it wasn't only uh, Father McBride, but uh, Benedict Rochelle, George Rutler, uh, ultimately Scott Hahn, and ultimately you, uh, and the list could go on. But um, I really became fascinated with the network. And so much so that after Cindy died, I mean, she would watch some of the programs with me. She didn't have the interest that I did in the sense of uh, really the topics that were being discussed and I was just energized by it. it. Gave me another avenue of something I really focus on other than medicine and her illness. So after her uh, death, I started watching it on a regular basis, became familiar with the program schedule, started watching the mass and she died in October of 1995. When I was at the meeting in Denver, in um, this would have been May of 96, after attending mass there at that hospital meeting, it just, I said, I'm gonna enter the Catholic Church. So when I kind of flew back, I went straight to Father Munn's office. He was the director of uh, pastoral care and mission effectiveness in the hospital at that time and told him I was coming into the Catholic Church. He jumped up out of the chair, gave me a bear hug and just said, what took you so long? <laughs> I went straight up stairs to the oncology floor to one of the sisters who's an oncology nurse and um, I said, I, I need to tell you, talk to you. Can you step in here to the treatment room? When I told her I was coming into the Catholic Church, she screamed. She had a syringe full of morphine that <laughs> sprayed off the ceiling. She dropped the syringe, hugged me, and then I looked at her and I said, well, sister, this is gonna require an incident report. And it did. So that, that was May of, um, let's see, May of 96. The bishop gave permission for me to have private instruction in the Catholic faith from Father Munn so that I didn't have to wait another time frame to go through RCIA. I never went through RCIA. I had one-on-one -on -one instruction. And then in um, October of uh, 96, I was received into the Catholic Church in the, ch the Catholic chapel there at St. Joseph Hospital in Augusta. It's a significant date. October the 5th. October the 5th, 1952 was the date that I was baptized by immersion in the First Baptist Church in Burlington, North Carolina. At about that same time, my future wife, Cindy, was born on October the 5th, 1952 in <laughs> Dallas, Texas. So I came into the church on October the 5th, 1996. So now every October the 5th, I have a trilogy to celebrate. That's and when right. I celebrate Mass, I always... That's right. All those different yes, births. October the 5th. Now, did, um, did, you, did any doctrinal issues form barriers for you in your journey in the church? Because from Baptist to Presbyterian and Catholic, there's a few doctrinal differences. 
actually, I can't say that there was a dramatic break or struggle. It was so gradual, mm -hmm. having been exposed to this over decades, and then attending mass conversations with priests, nuns, watching EWTN. I didn't have to really go to someone and just say, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with this. Not that I recall, mm -hmm. because uh, Father Munn did a, a wonderful job of Explaining, explaining everything, yeah, and and yeah. his story was that he left the Episcopal Church in be, in that window that John Paul II, and in 1984, he was ordained a Catholic priest, mm -hmm. and um, continued until his untimely death and uh, sudden death in 2006. But um, no, I I didn't have dramatic issues. You know, as we discussed earlier. Because of my work in, in healthcare ethics, it became obvious to me that the mainline Protestant denominations, one by one by one, over a period of time, caved to political correctness and endorsed abortion. Mm -hmm. As an ethicist, as a physician, I could not. Yeah accept that. And when the Presbyterian caved, I actually went to my uh, Presbyterian minister who's still, he's retired now, but uh, very vigorous, and we get together several times a month. And he's a very close friend. But I told him that I was leaving the, the Presbyterian tradition, that I was becoming Catholic, I had been moving, he'd known this for years that I had been moving and I said, now I am certain I am going to do it. And um, when I tell my story to various groups, different audiences, even in print, that it's, that was the final straw. When I realized that there is only one institution that has this consistent, correct, voice and posture on the abortion issue. It's the Roman Catholic Church and those in communion with her. Mm -hmm. But, and I said, I, with integrity, I cannot remain where I am. I'm, I'm going to go where hopefully I can make a difference. And I was wondering how this issue had to affect on you because uh, in my reading of, of medical ethics, ethicists ideas. There are a lot of ethicists out there that are looking at all kinds of ways to justify abortion and justify different angles, just, you know, when is a baby a human being and yes. a person and person, all those issues and uh, I mean so in some ways God was was protecting your heart and mind because there are a lot of ethicists around you I'm sure who are doing backflips to to be accepted amongst the politically correct. I guess is that those are issues that were surrounding you all the time. Well, they're out there. I was not. Right. They're, 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 yes, you're right. Certainly, they're they're out there. But going back to, it's not just abortion. We're talking about the whole spectrum of beginning of life, right. end of life issues. And I was privileged when. I, the other part of my story is what about discernment to priesthood? Mm -hmm. Because I shared that anecdote about um, obviously there was something that was <laughs> scaring me to death right. about that. Once I really started practicing my Catholic faith, going to Mass on a regular basis and getting more and more comfortable, that was again in May of um, 19, this would have been 1997. Uh, our meeting was in, um, or maybe it was in October, it was in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And I, at that time, I was sitting with a group of sisters, and when, during the Mass, the priest, the celebrant, this is in San Antonio, when he elevated the consecrated host, I sat, that's when I knew, and I thought, that's what I am called to do. 
All right, I fly back to Augusta. I go to Father Munn's office and tell him my experience. And again, he, he said, it's about time. <laughs> And so then I had to start the, uh, the formal process of discernment with the diocese, and that took a number of months, a number of meetings, and it went on over time, and eventually I was accepted as a seminarian candidate. And then I started to uh, backslide in the sense that, okay, I'm, I'm convinced this is what I should do, but it's not gonna work because there are too many obstacles. My affairs are too complicated. I'm involved in too many things. I can't just walk away, and I have to have a pattern of succession. I had all of these things that said it's not going to work. So then, okay, if it if it's meant to be, it will be. And I remember being at a mass on Johns Island, South Carolina, and I was sitting with my mother-in-law, and she's still Presbyterian. She was sitting by me, and I was looking at the bulletin for that Sunday. And then it said, Vocation Sunday. Hmm. Did you know that there are seminarians in this country for older men? And I thought, I didn't know that. Because one of the things that I was really going to balk at would have been, there's no way I could go back to school for four years and do these studies <laughs> with students who are younger than my son. <laughs> and then when I found out, that took that pressure off. And I thought, this is wonderful. So when I got back, I called the vocation director and, oh yes. Long story short, I ended up uh, at Blessed John the 23rd uh, National Seminary in Weston, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And um, this is for delayed vocations. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And it turned out that Al McBride was one of my faculty members. We became uh, friends and uh, still are but it's, uh, it was a wonderful four years and wouldn't take anything for it. Now you mentioned in our earlier conversations before the program that you were uh, connected with another guest I've had on the show, and that's John Haas. Yes. Uh, did he have any influence on your own journey? Well, actually, one of the things that I asked my diocese about was I was so excited to learn. I'd read a lot about the National Catholic Bioethics Center, a lot of their publications and knew about uh, Dr. Haas from writings and so forth. And when I did my clinical pastoral education, I was assigned to St. Elizabeth's Medical Center there in Boston. This was a second year seminarian. Mm -hmm. And it turned out, I was stunned to find out that, the head, that then the headquarters of the National Catholic Bioethics Center were on the hill right above the emergency room. <laughs> and so I went up there to visit and met the staff and subsequently asked about, well, can I apply to study here? And eventually got permission from the diocese through the bishop to do that. So I spent the summer of 2001 uh, there as, uh, at the center and uh, with Dr. Haas and some of the others. And it was a wonderful experience. And then I was able to work it out, it goes back to almost the double track that I was doing as an undergraduate with religious studies and pre-med, sure. I was able to, on my quote, day off at the seminary for the remaining years I had there to serve as an ethic staff ethicist and consultant for the NCBC there in Boston. And what a wonderful experience that was. Your, your journey and, and uh, what, what you're doing now just reminds me so much of how God prepares us all along with mm -hmm. certain gifts as well as issues of suffering to prepare us for the ultimate ways that we're going to serve Him. What are you doing now as a priest? How are you serving the Lord as a priest? Well, I was ordained in June of uh, 03, and I've spent my seven years of the priesthood in the deanery of Savannah and um, have had various assignments, all as a parochial vicar in different parishes. Since September the 1st of um, Last year, I've been the Catholic chaplain at two of the hospitals in Savannah. One is a uh, part of the Catholic system, St. Joseph Candler, the Candler campus, and then at uh, Memorial Health University there in, in Savannah. I've been on the ethics committee uh, at the St. Joseph Candler system for seven years and the Memorial Health 
-hmm. bioethics committee for five, and I'm also on the ethics committee for Hospice uh, Savannah. And that has been an enriching experience. It's been a great opportunity to meet policymakers, other ethicists who some are physicians, some are not, yep. and to be able to articulate the Catholic principles of how we do an ethical analysis. When you have as a cons an ethics consultant and, and there is a particular issue, the first thing we do is identify the issue, define it, and then work through a detailed analysis just like you do in differential diagnosis in medicine. The, the interesting thing here is that the Catholic system of analysis is one way and it has a tradition that goes back many centuries. Hmm. The secular tradition of doing an ethical analysis is different but the overwhelming majority of the times you come out with the same recommendation or conclusion. Hmm. And I can use either method or of analysis and explain to students what the process is. And talking of, speaking of students, I love to teach. I used to love to teach medical students. And now I have that opportunity again because in the setting where I am in Savannah, we have uh, two medical schools now. Uh, and I, I can teach ethics to doctors in training because what I've seen in my years away from the day-to-day -day practice of medicine how important it is to deal with these issues before an individual achieves that doctor of medicine degree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like called formation of conscience. That's what, that's what you're talking about. There are multiple uh, issues yeah, that yeah. Uh, I see that I try to engage them in dialogue to things to try to challenge them. We've got a couple minutes left. We've got an email. See if we can get this in, Father. Uh, this comes from Tommy in Georgia. Dear Father Markham, have you found any keys in the Catholic faith to help with grief, grief from the loss of your spouses? For me, the key was to appreciate through what my wife went through that to learn the redemptive value of suffering and the principle that healing is always possible when cure is not. Hmm. Yeah, that, re that whole idea of redemptive suffering was something I, I had not been familiar with at all in my Presbyterian background. I, I, nor I. And even as leaning toward Catholicism yeah. and only in reflection as looking back at what my wife, the mm -hmm. grace and how she dealt with her illness, the witness that she gave and realizing that she was at peace. Boy, it would seem that having that perspective on suffering would also make a big difference on the practice of a, of a, of a medical doctor, how he viewed what he would do if he recognized the redemptive aspect of suffering it would change a lot of perspective on that too, it would seem to me. It definitely would, Yeah, it right. definitely would. Father, I'm wondering in a brief moment, could we have your blessing as we close the program? Could you bless the audience? Sure. Almighty God and Father, we praise you for your goodness. We thank you for your many gifts. The gift of our very lives, of lives shared and lives redeemed the gift of our Catholic faith, the gift of this network that enables us to share that faith with such a wide audience. We ask your blessing upon the Coming Home Network, the Eternal Word Television Network, and its ministries. And we ask you to bless us 
empower us with your Holy Spirit to be effective witnesses to your truth. We ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may God, in his mercy and love, bless all in our audience. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. Thank you.